You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. I'm Garrett Peterson, and my guest today is Kyle Harper of the University of Oklahoma. Kyle, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Hi, Garrett. Thanks for having me. Yeah, happy to happy to have you on. So Kyle is a historian, and he's the author of a book entitled The Fate of Rome, Climate, Disease, and the End of Empire, the End of an Empire, and that's going to be our topic for today. Kyle, your, your book's really interesting because, um, you know, I, I think it's one could naively think that uh, the fall of Rome is something that happened in the distant past, and every year we uh, get further away from it and it gets harder to study. But there's really a lot of new ground being broken and a lot of new discoveries happening in this history. And uh, and your book is a great, um, uh, you know, a, a great discussion of um, sort of new angles and new new information about uh, about this period that, um, you know, if, if people have read uh, Gibbon <laughs> or or some of the uh, so, or you know maybe a, a summary in a high school history textbook, they wouldn't necessarily get uh, on the topic of the fall of Rome, which is just I think very inherently interesting. Um, so why don't you start with a sort of elevator pitch of the book and a little bit about how you came to write it? Sure. Well, to to underscore what you were saying, the historians like to write books. I think economists or onto something and preferring to write articles because books take uh, years to write. And in the, the sort of corner of the field where I'm working, which is at the intersection of biology and history, um, it really moves at the, at the speed of the natural sciences. So it's um, uh, pretty amazing to reflect that even though my book on the environmental history of Rome only came out a few years ago, what we've learned even in the last couple of years is pretty amazing. And it's really characteristic of this this field as a whole and the ways that the natural sciences, um, principally um, biology and microbiology, um, are sort of changing and deepening what we know about um, human history. So I, I got really interested in that as a, as a grad student, um, partly, I would say, out of a um, indecisiveness that's, that's just part of my character. I kind of like um, everything. And so sometimes I wish I were an economist. Sometimes I wish I were a biologist. Um, and one of the good things about being a historian is that um, you can you can find ways to, to interact with so many different disciplines and ways of approaching the human past. And um, so partly I, I just have an interest in um, different fields and try to look at the, the piece of the past that I know best, which is the high and later Roman Empire. Uh, by bringing to bear the the tools of other disciplines. And um, I was also very fortunate long ago now when I was a PhD student to have mentors who were very encouraging of interdisciplinary work and um, who, who always um, tried to push me and give me opportunities to to do things that, that were, um, you know, experimental, um, meaning that there's, there's always going to be failure and stumbles along the way. But um, but also higher reward and I think more satisfying because there really are new things to be said. And so, as you say, um, the, the Roman Empire um, and its history are changing. And we know a lot more than we did. Don't forget Gibbon, whose History of the Decline and Fall came out, um, first volume in 1776. Um, we know things about the, the history of the Roman Empire now that we didn't know five years ago, 10 years ago. And so just to take one single but i think telling example um, we've long known from very traditional sources that the roman empire in its later phases in the sixth century so this is really the very much the the late roman empire under the reign of the famous emperor justinian uh, who rules for decades through the middle of the sixth century that the roman empire was struck by a really significant pestilence and um, there were reasons to believe from the textual witnesses that it was probably bubonic plague, but there were lingering doubts and reasonable, reasonable ones. Um, and that question has been definitively settled because we now have the the DNA of the actual pathogen of the bacterium named Yersinia pestis that's the causative agent of bubonic plague. 
it's been recovered from now about a dozen different sites uh, that belong to the 6th and early 7th century, so precisely the period of this pandemic, and allow, in the first place, definite biological identification so that we now know beyond a shadow of a doubt. This was the germ that caused this disease outbreak that we see described in so many different texts of the period. But it actually also tells us things that we didn't know. It, it helps fill in um, what were kind of shadowy areas of the empire and post-imperial territories where we just don't have very much of a written record and we just didn't really know is the plague there, is it not there? Now we can find it archaeologically and expand our knowledge of where the plague was and how far it reached, um, how fast it moved, what it was like biologically, how it related to other strains of the same pathogen. So that's the kind of evidence that, that we're uh, lucky enough to live in a time where we have, and I think as historians, we should always be trying to say what what are the biggest things that we we don't know that we might learn if we if we take risks and try and engage with other fields of knowledge. Yeah, that's really interesting. So even twenty years ago, people would have been reading some account from a you know a monk or someone who is writing down what they saw around them. And trying to diagnose this disease based on, you know, what symptoms, you know, it's a, <laughs> some guy happened to write down and, you know, where his writings happened to have come down to us, you know, very sparse as they were. And now we just have the, you know, the DNA of the, of the disease itself from bodies that, <laughs> of people who died during it uh, and, and just much stronger evidence than you could ever uh than you could ever get from a you know a written source uh or you know the the uh traditional history as you call it uh so it's uh it it, it is an exciting time and um and I love the way your book uh sort of weaves this into a larger narrative about um about Rome and the sort and the the decline and fall of the empire so let's uh let's talk about that then um you know as as the subtitle of your book is climate disease and the end of an empire so um did previous histories um say much about uh, about climate and disease or was it mostly ignored up till uh the 21st century well it, no it's not been totally ignored it's just been hard to to pin down and i think it's important to start by even very briefly defining what the the fall of the Roman Empire, the end of the empire means, because it can mean uh, almost as many different things as there are historians. But when I'm talking about it, I'm talking about a process that is very prolonged in time. So um, starting in the, the second century AD, which is the, the apex of the Roman Empire and the age of the Pax Romana, when the Roman army enjoys um, rather rather strong sort of military hegemony over this vast territory that, that covers uh, areas in three continents. And it's the um, period of the greatest prosperity. So um, I argue that the Roman Empire and its, and its early phases, these, these kind of early days of the first and second century, um, creates the conditions for real intense economic growth. And um, both through the um, innovation of new technologies, but particularly through the investment and fusion of existing technologies, and then above all through the expansion of trade. Um, and so what economists call Smithian growth, the kind of specialization, comparative advantage that can um, create per capita growth when there's um, bigger markets, better integration. Um, that is fostered by the Roman Empire, which has good institutions that have property rights and allow credit markets to function. Um, it creates a zone of peace where you can ship things across the Mediterranean without having to worry about pirates um, and so on. All of this promotes um, a kind of pre-industrial growth um, that's fairly significant um, by pre-industrial standards. And this is what we are really looking at when we look at the ruins of a Roman city. You're looking at um, the kind of height of imperial and economic growth in the middle of the second century. And it's also driven by sheer 
um, growth in aggregate production from population expansion. So the Roman imperial population peaks sometime in the middle of the second century, maybe at 75 million, although that's debated, um, and probably about one in four uh, of every human beings alive on earth at the time live inside the Roman Empire. So that's the starting point. And then in different parts of the empire on different tempos in different phases, that is not a one-way process, but with back and forth, um, the Roman Empire uh, changes and the population in the very long run declines, uh, per capita output uh, declines, urbanization declines, and the political uh, unity of the Roman Empire is fragmented in the West, particularly badly. Um, in the East, there's political unity for much longer, certainly um, through most of the, the late Roman period into the sixth century, um, when you start to see it get um, fragmented, first in say, the Balkans and then in the seventh century with the Islamic conquests that take um, Syria, Palestine, Egypt. And North Africa. So um, it's a process of political disintegration um, that has backs and forths. And it's a, a period of uh, very long term um, economic um, disintegration as well de urbanization, decline in trade, demographic contraction, uh, and overall per capita output declines. So um, that's, that's what I mean by the Roman Empire. And I think it's impossible, given what we now know, to, to tell that story responsibly without including nature. So if I had to distill my, my argument down to two words, it would simply be that nature matters. Um, not that, that nature rules all or determines everything, um, but pre-industrial societies are agrarian, so most output is agricultural. Um, they have no biomedical or public health interventions that do any good. So they're extremely exposed to, um, to infectious disease and they're very vulnerable to biological shocks. And when you just try and think about the, the magnitude of some of the, the shocks that are experienced by the Roman Empire, such as a series of pestilences, um, I think we have to conclude that these are an important part of the story that need to be integrated into um, any narrative of what happens, where does the population go, and then what are the kind of second order effects of that on Roman politics, Roman fiscal systems, Roman military systems um, that are obviously highly complex. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's it's easy and, you know, was in the past very popular to tell the whole story of the fall of Rome in terms of you know, major dramatic battles and, uh, you know, and the, the reigns of particularly competent or incompetent leaders. And from what you're saying, it's, it's not that those things don't matter, but it's that these uh, natural and biological factors play a huge role and shouldn't be ignored. Um, exactly. Uh, which is, a, which is a, you know, a, a great point and a really interesting um, you know, addition to the the narrative about about uh, Rome and the decline and fall of uh, Rome. Um, so let's talk about um, the sort of the timeline of events. Uh, you know, you you um you know I have uh you have a, a timeline in your book where you um where you talk where you have the the climate history the disease history the imperial history and then specific historical figures all on a timeline from 200 BC to 700 AD which is you know very sort of helpful to put everything in um in perspective we we could talk about uh the diseases um you have the the Antonine plague the plague in 165, this plague of Cyprian in 249, and then the Justinianic plague in uh, 541 with later outbreaks as well. Do you want to talk about uh, those three plagues and what uh, what made the Romans particularly vulnerable to them? Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, I want to talk about these three plagues. These are, uh, these are uh, to me, some of the most fascinating events in, in all of Roman history. Um, and they're all very different, and they have very different causes and very different consequences. 
the Antonine Plague is the um, first of these really pandemics that strike the Roman Empire. And it's worth pausing um, over that because even coming to grips with the the spatial um, and temporal scale of disease outbreaks is important and revealing. Um, we've sort of pandemic has become a household word um, for us. Um, it's actually kind of a strange, strange word that it doesn't um, isn't used as a medical term in, in antiquity, even though it has Greek roots. But it means a a sudden explosive disease event that occurs over multiple regions. So, say multiple continents in the case of the Roman Empire and. Um, I've studied carefully the the written evidence for you know, disease outbreaks in the the Roman world from the late Republic to the to the High Empire, and there's certainly um, volatility, instability in the mortality regime, as there would be in any pre modern society where infectious diseases are the main cause of death. Um, so death doesn't come um, in kind of entirely predictable. Um, um, waves every year. It it varies. There's good years. There's bad years. Um, there's healthy years. There's sickly years. And it's driven by a range of different things, um, including the climate, which affects agricultural production. That infect, affects people's nutrition. Um, it's affected by the coming and going of different diseases. Um, but the um, the I think stark pattern is that there aren't pandemics. There aren't interregional sudden explosive disease events in the Roman Empire, that is, until the 160s, when all of a sudden we have a really significant number of of, um, witnesses that testify that there was a disease event that they describe as um, encompassing the whole world. A number of sources use that exact language. We would call it a pandemic. They say that the disease was brought back by Roman soldiers returning from a campaign in Parthia, um, so deep inside what's now Iraq, where they um, sacked a very important city named Seleucia um, and um, desecrated a a temple of the god Apollo um, and caused a a miasma or pollution um, to escape that would cover the whole world and make it sick. Um, Obviously, that story is a little suspect um, in its details, but it, it does reflect their observation that um, a massive disease event broke out. And so there's, there's no doubt that, um, that in the 160s, there is some kind of disease outbreak that um, affects basically every Roman province. And we don't know exactly what biological pathogen caused it. Um, the leading contender is the smallpox virus, um, which um, is is a good possibility. There are reasons to think it could be smallpox. So um, one of our contemporary sources is a doctor who describes um, the outbreak of these really horrific black pustules um, all over the body um, that progress slowly. Um, it was a highly lethal disease. Um, yet it's very hard, as you were saying earlier, to, to know what biological agent caused an agent disease event only from these kinds of sources. They're uh, imprecise. They don't have germ theory. Um, they conceive of health and disease in very different terms that make it an enormous challenge to, to diagnose historical disease events. And, um, and yet, um, someday we may have DNA evidence for, for this episode. We don't at present. Nobody's been able to sequence um, the, the genome of the, the pathogen that caused the Antonine Plague. Um, it's debated how significant demographically it was. People have said everything from 2%, which is unrealistically low, to a third of the imperial population, which I think is unrealistically high. Um, I think it was a disease event that was multiple times the the normal annual mortality and that it caused um, a serious demographic um, um, shortfall in the, the immediate term in the Roman Empire. And yet, even as destabilizing as this is, the Roman Empire doesn't um, disintegrate. They, they, um, they seriously are, are able to, to recuperate from this biological shock. I think things were different afterwards, but um, we don't necessarily need to see the, the Antonine Plague as sort of uh, the inevitable uh, beginning of the end. It's just a, a biological shock caused by what's almost certainly um, a new uh, pathogen introduced into the Roman disease pool, 
um, that causes a, a serious demographic um, issues that the Roman Empire then has to, to grapple with. That's a quick summary of the, the Antonine Plague in the 160s, um, stretching into the next decade or so. The, the Roman Empire then enjoys a kind of respite in the early third century. We don't have evidence for large scale pandemics um, throughout the, the first half of the third century until again, we come down to the very middle of this period um, around the, the year 250. Um, the dating is, is a little bit difficult to nail down, but, but within a year or so of the year 250, um, the Roman Empire starts to experience again uh, a major pandemic event that is well attested um, in the east, in the west, in the north, in the south, um, a sudden explosive disease outbreak that was um, a, a clearly a, a major demographic factor uh, in this period. Historians know this period as the crisis of the third century. Um, I tend to, to, to be on the, the side that sees this as a significant point of rupture in the Roman Empire. I don't think it was inevitable that the Roman Empire would survive this, this serious crisis that is multifaceted. It's a fiscal crisis, so the Roman um, coinage is debased in the extreme, and it initiates a period of very rapid inflation that would take um, almost almost three generations to get completely under control. So it's a fiscal monetary crisis. Um, it's a military crisis that sees the Roman Empire challenged both on the northern frontier when new federations of Germanic troops, namely the Goths, um, invade deep inside the Roman Empire simultaneously across the eastern frontier, a more militant Persian Empire. Um, invades the Roman um, provinces in the east and causes serious trouble. Um, it's a period of political or dynastic crises. Um, there's a crisis of legitimacy as um, within the space of a generation, you have almost um, two dozen imperial pretenders and contenders um, fighting one another for control of the Roman armies. So, so many things go wrong at once. The, the plague that we know, the plague of Cyprian, we do not know what germ caused it, but um, it was uh, quite apparently a, a serious disease that caused um, demographic um, shortfalls that, that were part of this broader economic, social, political upheaval um, that we call the crisis of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire, I don't think, was destined to survive this, but it does. Um, but it only does so because it comes back in a very different form. And so the empire that's put back together by a series of emperors like Aurelian, Diocletian, you know, Constantine is a very different kind of empire. You have a very different kind of emperor with a very different social logic um, governing the, the top strata and the relations between the ruling elites and the army. Um, you have a very different tax system, very different monetary system. And I don't think it's shocking that soon thereafter you have a very different religion. So this is the, the time period when um, paganism goes into terminal decline um, and Christianity becomes ultimately the official religion of the Roman Empire. So it's a period of great transformation, uh, but the Roman Empire in this different guise does come back and um, ultimately survives both the, the plague of Cyprian and, and the broader crisis. Then there's, there's an, again, a period where you don't see large-scale pandemics that are explosive disease events that encompass the entire empire until the 6th century. And this is really the biggest bang of them all. Um, in 541, a disease outbreak begins that we call the Justinianic Plague. As mentioned, we know with certainty the biological cause of this. It is the bacterium, Yersinia pestis. This is the same germ that caused the Black Death in the late Middle Ages and the 1340s. Um, that is the single worst mortality crisis in the history of the Near East and Europe. Um, and we have, I think, good reasons to think that the plague of Justinian, um, its closest parallel is the Black Death. I think it's a kind of early medieval Black Death that parallels um, the, the late medieval um, pandemic. It is um, a, a, a disease that is really a disease of rodents. Humans are incidental hosts. We don't transmit it easily between each other, although we can. Um, it's mainly spread by the bite of fleas um, that live on rodents, particularly the black rat, which is one of the really important vectors of the disease that uh, help spread what's really a, a massive 
outbreak of an animal disease that humans get caught up in as kind of collateral damage. So it's an ecologically pretty fascinating um, disease. And um, it causes enormous destruction, partly because it's not a human disease. It's not adapted to us. We're not transmitters. We're, we're only sort of incidental, accidental hosts that are, um, that are sort of um, innocent bystanders who get caught up in this um, extraordinary um, animal disease events. It's um, what makes it even worse is that this disease breaks out and for a series of years, 541 to 544, um, fairly quickly spreads across the, the Mediterranean and then recedes, but only temporarily. For the next 200 years, every 10 years or so, um, the disease flares up again. Some of these flare ups are pretty big and they spread and originally some of them are more local. Um, there's a lot of interest right now in trying to understand the persistence of the plague in Western Eurasia and North Africa over these two centuries. But for the two centuries that it lingers in the, the West, it is um, the single most devastating disease. And again, this parallels the Black Death and the centuries that followed. After the Black Death brings the, the germ back to the West, it stays, it, it develops local reservoirs and continues to break out repeatedly. And it remains for centuries, um, the single most deadly disease. And sometimes people, I think, underestimate um, the kind of power of the plague in these later phases. So we're all, I think everybody knows the Black Death and you associate this horrific outbreak of the bubonic plague in the 14th century. But what's really important is that it stays around and it it weighs down on the demographic regime for centuries. I mean, even in the 17th century, the 1600s, um, plague is the most fearsome biological uh, enemy that humans have. And the, the sheer power of the, the plague to, to shape societies and economies um, is simply stunning. So the, the later Roman period is known as the, the age of the first plague pandemic because um, Yersinia pestis comes to, to the Mediterranean region, establishes local reservoirs. It hangs out um, for two centuries, every 10 years or so, causes these um, horrific outbreaks in different parts of the Roman and formerly Roman territories. And then it disappears. Um, around 750, it, it simply stops um, and populations start to really grow again. So um, we've, we've really learned a lot in the last decade. Um, that, that lets us kind of piece together this, this narrative and I think see in a little richer profile the importance of some of these um, pathogens as agents in human history. Yeah, and it, it's, it's amazing how, um, you know, it, it's amazing how corrosive that would be to, uh, you know, to a society like the Romans that is all, you know, and it has an economy based on long distance trade and, you know, high levels of urbanization. You can just see how getting hit with a terrible plague every 10 years or so, you know, <laughs> would just uh, be beat you into the ground and kind of force you to, you know, prevent you from uh, from having those kind of same levels of interconnectedness and travel um, and trade and and all these things that really are at the heart of what the Roman Empire is all about. Yeah, I mean, life life is uh, life is short, uncertain, and difficult, even at the best of times in the Roman Empire without the plague. But when the plague takes root, um, it it really exerts a kind of unique and and um, challenging influence over societies where it takes hold. Yeah, and I mean, I I think the um, you know, there's sort of a you know, an implicit counterfactual here where maybe, you know, without, without the Justin, Justinianic plague, without this sort of extreme strain, maybe Justinian reunites the empire and it just keeps going on for, you know, more centuries. Maybe it continues in some form or another to the, you know, just diverging from the history we actually saw and, and being really a very different world. At that point, it's just you know, impossible to speculate about uh, about all the things that would be different without this um, this uh, plague. Um, so I, I guess I, I you know I've got some uh, some que more questions about the Justinian Justinianic plague. Do we have any idea 
you know, where it comes from. I know with the, um, you know, the, the, when the black death hits, uh, you know, hits Europe a thousand years later, um, or almost a thousand years later, we, we can kind of trace its spread from, you know, from central Asia and the Mongols to, uh, you know, through, through the black sea and, and up through Southern Europe. Uh, do we, do we have that kind of, um, yeah, that kind of clear it's a, path? It's a great question. It's a great question and a pretty lively one right now, because this is, uh, precisely the kind of question that the, the broadening of the genetic evidence can help us understand. And so it, one, it, it has turned out that, that Central Asia, um, um, and basically the step from um, far western China, um, even parts of Mongolia, the Tian Shan mountain range, the um, into Kazakhstan, um, um, and probably, as we'll learn more um, with more and more evidence, um, even further west into the steppe. That is really the the authentic reservoir homeland where the plague bacillus um, is more or less permanently established. And it dwells there as a, um, as a parasite of burrowing rodents. So particularly, um, gerbils and marmots, um, in Central Asia that are, um, that are good host, um, reservoirs for the plague bacterium. And the giant pandemic events that are famous are kind of spillovers when for reasons that are imperfectly understood, the, the plague bacterium spills out of its kind of ancestral um, reservoirs and uh, is able to, to explosively spread in other animal populations, particularly other rodent populations like black rat populations. So the genetic evidence has really helped identify the geographic homeland of the, the plague bacterium. And um, it is possible to to trace the um, the kind of spread of the the plague bacterium in the, the Black Death period, both from genetic and from written sources that help track its itinerary as it moves, um, as you say, over overland in Central Asia and then ultimately um, comes into the Black Sea and Mediterranean region um, in the middle of the 14th century. The the first pandemic um, isn't quite there yet. The the closest relatives um, of it seem to inhabit a, a similar region um, in Central Asia. What we don't really know is exactly how it got to the West. Now, um, I want to say that the I'm persuaded that the the um, written evidence here is still very important, and so um, the one of the really important eyewitnesses to the Justinian plague is a Greek historian named Procopius. He was a kind of middling official um, in the Roman imperial bureaucracy, highly educated Greek. He was a, a kind of super arch traditionalist um, who um, admired classical Greek culture and wrote um, histories of his age that were written in this highly classicizing style. He was um, fairly hostile to the Emperor Justinian, to say the least. Um, and he, he's one of our main sources for the, the outbreak of the plague. And, um, I think his, his account is, um, quite, quite a good one. And one of the things he says with really extraordinary precision is that the plague first broke out in Pelusia, which is a town. It's, you know, it's kind of a middling town. Uh, on the, the shores of the Mediterranean in Egypt, um, in the very far northeastern um, corner of Egypt on the Mediterranean. And it's right where the closest point to come overland from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean is. So it was an important corridor for exchange between the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. Now, that would be a strange place for plague to first appear if it had come overland, um, as the Black Death did across the Silk Roads, which we know were very active um, highways of commerce between the East and West in this period as well. And so if Procopius is right, 
then and and you may be it suggests that the the plague arrived over shipping networks through the Red Sea and perhaps across um, the Indian Ocean. So we know that the the Romans traded extensively for silk and spices um, across the the Red Sea and Indian Ocean. So if Procopius is right that it first appears at Pelusium, then um, it, it at least encourages us to think that the first pandemic um, was shipped from its um, homeland in Central Asia, ultimately to the West, um, on board a ship, which is possible because ships carry um, rats, black rats, very well, um, and it's it's plausible. I'll say that the plausibility of this is added by the um, the overall timing and spread. So we know that the plague was in Alexandria um, a year before it was in Constantinople. Um, it started in northern Egypt, or it first appeared to, to Romanize in northern Egypt, and then spread through the Near East. So it's in um, Palestine and Syria before it's in Constantinople, where it arrives the next spring. So I think the account of Procopius and what we know about the, the itinerary of the plague in its first year suggests that it appeared in 541 on the southern shores of the Mediterranean. Now, I'll be the first to admit that. Um, that it seems like it would be easier for it to be carried overland um, and to, to reach the Roman Empire via Persia. But we also hear that Persia wasn't struck until um, the following year. So um, right now, um, you know, I think people are trying to think this through and to figure out, should we believe Procopius? Do we, do, is what we know about the itinerary of the plague and its first year reliable? Um, if it is, what does that mean about how it got? Um, from Central Asia to the West. Um, but these are the, the kind of exciting questions that we can now try and ask in light of both historical and genetic evidence. Um, and, and just a, a question about these plagues. Uh, you know, they're, as you said, their reservoirs are in, you know, Central Asia. Is it that the populations in those regions have, you know, more immunity to them or less affected, but when they spread to the West, they kind of, uh, you know, hit these populations that don't have as much exposure. I'm thinking kind of like, uh, sort sort of like all the um, the smallpox and other diseases that spread through the New World when uh, when those populations made contact. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm skeptical of that. I think it's safe to say that that there's there's not any evidence for um, Central Asian or East Asian populations having. Um, evolved innate immunity to the to the plague. So at the very least, there's there's no evidence for that, and I don't think it's very plausible. Plague still um, affects people in, in Central Asia and China. Um, it's extremely dangerous, although it's very treatable by antibiotics. Thank goodness. So so I don't think that's that's realistic. And I think more generally, we have to be cautious about assuming. Um, that that there's something really special about virgin what used to be called virgin soil epidemics. I think it's there's there's some possibility for imagining that there are major population level differences in a native immunity that are um, accumulated over periods of time when one population is able to to adapt or, or is under evolutionary pressure from a pathogen. We know that human populations. Um, do have meaningful genetic differences in the genes. Um, so there's there's a basis for that kind of speculation. But um, we don't really very well understand the mechanisms of those in most cases. Some of the exception are um, genetic immunities to, to malaria um, the, that cause things like sickle cell uh, anemia or other um, red blood cell um, um, disorders that are not immunity genes, but are, are related to the ability to resist malaria infection. But beyond that, um, we have a relatively limited understanding of what specific um, immunities populations have evolved in the face of, of pathogen threats. So I think people are pretty um, cautious, rightly, about um, ascribing um, tremendous effects to um, the virgin soil um, epidemics. The, just the bottom line is flu is terrible. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, flu is, flu is terrible. Plague is terrible. Um, it doesn't matter 
um, you know, what what um, human population come from. Um, plague is is a uniquely horrible pathogen that um, is just um, just one of the worst things you can contract. But uh, as I said, thankfully, it's a bacterium and uh, a, a good round of antibiotics taken early in the course of an infection, um, and you should be fine. Right. So, so maybe the but try uh, not to get plagued, Garrett. If you can, oh, yeah, for if sure. you can help it, try not to get plagued. <laughs> yeah. Don't ever, you know, if you're driving through the Rocky Mountains and you see uh, dead prairie dogs, just uh, stay away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely not, uh, not a good idea. But yeah, so it it, it might be that uh, these Central Asian populations were get getting hit with uh, these diseases on a regular basis but we just don't have a the, you know a procopius to write it down and uh and tell us about it every time it happens and uh, no, that's exactly right certainly in the case of the first pandemic in the in the case of the second pandemic there is actually some limited evidence for these kinds of outbreaks in central asia they're indirect and um well well there obviously are um, nomadic societies in central asia that don't have um extensive written records um, there are also more um, settled agricultural societies in, um, you know, places where there's watersheds or oases um, throughout Central Asia, and those um, cultures do have have more robust written records. And there there is indication of at least some kinds of pandemic or epidemic diseases. Um, there's a very important set of Nestorian gravestones from the, the early 14th century that show um, a sharp rise in um, mortality. So something bad was happening on the um, steps in the early 14th century that's probably related to the bubonic plague. Mm, interesting. Uh, so let's um, let's pivot a little um, to. So we've talked a lot about plague, and I think I'm I'm fairly convinced that you know these these recurring plagues were a big punch to the gut of the Roman Empire. That uh, you know were pot- potentially decisive, although these things are always m- multi-causal in, uh, in its, you know, de- decline and, and uh, in the, the Western Empire falling and not coming back um, or being reunited in, in any way for, you know, uh, at all. So, um, but uh, let's, let's pivot and talk a little bit about climate. You know, your, your, uh, your timeline that I mentioned, it mentions the, the Roman climate optimum from 200 BC to 150 AD the late Roman transitional period from 150 to 450, and then the late antique Little Ice Age from 450 to 700. I think this is um, kind of a really, really interesting way of looking at uh, this history because, you know, we, we can know with a lot of precision how, how the climate changed in the past. You know, we've gotten very good at studying climate. Uh, and but, uh, but any kind of chronicler from back then, if the change happened you know, in over a longer time frame than a single human lifespan, you can see them just kind of missing it, not not maybe realizing how these uh, chain big changes were were happening that uh, that uh, may may have you know been upstream of some uh, some you know political changes that uh, that they would have noticed. So so what 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 do we what do you mean when you uh, refer to the Roman climate optimum? Yeah, I mean it's a it's a construct that is just a way to to help frame um, thinking about the the role of climate variability and climate change in the in the ancient past. And I think it's important or worth noting that um, the Roman climate optimum isn't something I came up with. It's um, a technical or it's a term of art that um, has been well established for decades. Um, in the paleoclimate literature. So it's not even Roman, Roman historians who came up with it. Rather, it's um, people who study the, the history of the Earth and the past climate um, who recognize that there was a period of a few centuries um, in the, the late centuries BC and the first century or century and a half AD um, that were characterized by relative stability in the the broad stretch of late Holocene climate. This is a fairly stable period. And it's also one of um, relative warmth in the Northern Hemisphere. And there's quite a bit of evidence 
um, that both of those things are true, um, that, that the climate is stable and warm across much of the, you know, the hemisphere. That doesn't necessarily, you know, optimum um, implies a value judgment. That doesn't necessarily mean the climate is good or bad. Um, the climate isn't really good or bad um, in ancient times. It's um, variable and it promotes um, or hinders agricultural output. Remember, these are agricultural societies that are um, almost totally dependent on the weather um, for economic productivity. And so they're very sensitive. They're very sensitive to, to change on multiple timescales, just as you say. Um, and both short, um, short-term climate variability, so think like uh, a crop failure that, that follows um, an extreme drought, um, or longer-term decadal to centennial scale patterns, say warming on the order of a degree or two centigrade, um, which might not be perceived by an individual observer, but might have fairly significant effects in say, the Mediterranean or Northern Europe, in the amount of grain that can be sown, um, the kind of acreage that can, can effectively be relied upon to produce um, wheat or, or other crops. Um, one of the challenges right now, I think, is, is trying to sort of get a grip on what, what we know happened in the climate um, and to, to try and model what effect it might have had on agricultural output. That's that's something where I think we still have a lot of opportunity to, to learn and to, to deepen our understanding. But it's exciting. We've learned a lot about the, the tempo and nature of climate changes. We know that the, the early Roman Empire, very broad strokes, did enjoy a pretty stable climate um, and one that was probably pretty conducive to, to bringing um, acreage um, under under cultivation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. and. You know, you, uh, I don't know, you read this, you read these uh, Roman histories and they're talking about, um, you know, just how reliant they are on, on North Africa for, for their food supply. And, uh, and you kind of, you know, you know, it's not necessary. I don't think North Africa is, you know, super duper productive, you know, by, by the, by the early modern period. Uh, and, you know, if you, if you're trying, if you're like zooming out, to the level of you know looking at uh, human history or European history from you know from really really you know really high bird's eye view, you sort of see this the locus of political power sort of shift from Southern Europe, you know, and Italy and the Mediterranean up to to Northern Europe over the course of uh, you know a couple thousand years, and we tell ourselves stories about you know great leaders and uh, and battles and. You know, and I it, but it kind of seems like a lot of that is changing climate, making some places less productive and some places more productive, and then, uh, and then you know, sort of other other things shifting as a as a result of that. Would you sort of agree with that? uh, You know, broad analysis, or or um, yeah, what what uh, what truth is there to that? Well, I think it's a great, it's a, it's one of the, it's a great question. I think it's one that we ought to be asking on that scale. And economic historians do ask, you know, why, why does um, Northern Europe become the, the sort of cradle of, of growth and then industrialization? And, um, and it's a, it's a, one of the really important questions we can ask about history. <laughs> How does that happen? It's such a, a singular, um, miracle um, that, that frees humanity from um, misery and premature death. Um, and it's, it's, it's very surprising that it happens in um, Northern and Northwestern Europe, um, which are certainly backwaters in classical period of antiquity um, and from most of the Middle Ages and even into the, the beginnings of the early modern period. And, um, you know, somewhere along the way, and it's debated, but um, certainly looks like the 16th or 17th century, um, the, the center of gravity flips and Italy, um, which had been in the vanguard, certainly um, in the late Middle Ages and the beginning of the early modern period, um, trade, and technology, and um, the gap of income, um, the great commercial republics. And that, that position of leadership 
um, is lost, but it's it's not just Italy. It's a much broader phenomenon that um, many of the, the kind of powerhouse societies of the, the kind of lower latitudes um, ultimately lose out um, in the, the kind of race to industrialization. And um, the, the, the reasons for that, you know, climate may be a, a dimension. Um, I, I don't necessarily think that that's going to be um, the, the biggest part of the answer. I think it has a lot to do with the, the rise of um, the Atlantic economy and the rise of um, Atlantic facing cities and the rise of kind of mercantile classes um, in those cities and their um, political clout that allows them to, to agitate for um, certain kinds of institutions that, that um, limit executive power, protect property rights, promote credit markets, um, allow uh, free trade and um, incorporation. So um, I think those are probably the, the drivers. Um, I think you also have to ask, you know, why did student capital expand um, in the, those same regions? But, you know, those are those big questions are, are the meaningful ones and they're certainly the fun ones. And I think having an ancient perspective can help because you would never have predicted um, in the Roman world either the, the Industrial Revolution was going to happen or certainly that it would happen where it did. Yeah, yeah. You're reading Caesar's commentaries and he, uh... He sort of gets to the the farthest, you know, most distant corner of the world in, you know, Britannia, and uh, and yeah, you really wouldn't think that, uh, you know, that this, you know, extreme backwater, far from, you know, all the the established civilization and the urbanized, uh, you know, populations and and trade and and uh, technology and all these things would 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 be so important to world history, um, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, 1500 years later, but, uh, yeah, or even more. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it's, um, you know, it's all, it's all interesting and it just paints this, uh, you know, this very multifaceted sort of picture with, with so many, so many moving parts, uh, you know, the, the climate and, and diseases and, and then, you know, the, statecraft and and rulers and battles and all all these things kind of different different parts interacting with each other uh in in sometimes complex ways and un, unraveling it is uh is really really interesting I, I i want to uh just sort of ask uh one more question which is um there's sort of a a view that people have that uh you know that these great empires you know, they, they become, they, they're a victim of their own success. They have lots of success, they get rich, but then that, that makes them decadent and, and, uh, and then they get, um, lazy and sort of, uh, and bring about their own demise. You know, I'm not a proponent of, of that view, but maybe there's another story where societies get, get very wealthy and then they get, highly urbanized they end up with lots of trade and that makes them more vulnerable to pandemics and disease um and then you still have a story where sort of development leads to uh can lead to crisis without you know appropriate public health interventions to uh to stop it but maybe a very different one than uh than people have um a different mechanism than people have proposed in the past what what do you think about uh, that yeah i mean that is so. Both of those arguments are made by the, the great 14th century uh, historian Ibn Khaldun, uh, who develops this brilliant uh, model of the the cycles of civilization or the cycles of political dynasties. Um, that really argues both of those things that there is this kind of what he calls group solidarity asabia that that is characteristic of civilizations on the rise when there's a kind of collectivist um, enthusiasm for for sacrifice, and um, and this promotes cohesion that, that promotes kind of military power and feeds conquest, and then is fed by conquest in turn. But then on the flip side, um, once a civilization has risen to power like that, that precisely those kind of ingredients of corruption from within um, that undermine group solidarity. 
um, will promote um, lack of cohesion and breakdown. Interestingly, he also includes disease and infectious disease within that picture. And this is somebody who lived through the plague um, and understood the, the power of diseases. But he did argue that um, there's a kind of um, endogenous role for plagues that in, is spurred by development, trade, urbanization, that brings bigger populations together that are more conducive to the spread of diseases. So he has no concept of germ theory. He doesn't really understand the mechanisms. But I think there's a kind of um, beauty to that insight that that paradoxically some of the the very patterns of, that are associated with with progress or development at least um, economic development, um, trade and urbanization um, create ecological platforms that are also conducive to, to the transmission of infectious diseases. Um, so I think there's something to that model, but I also think that. Um, we have to leave a big role for, for totally random exogenous um, shocks that basically come from outside any endogenous system or mechanism um, that, that are provided a source of kind of instability for, for complex human systems um, and the evolution of new pathogens, whether it's smallpox or bubonic plague, um, have been a recurrent source of these kind of exogenous shocks um, that, are, that are sort of um, unpredictable, but but inevitable. Yeah, it's the the uh, predictable rise and fall theory versus the sort of random walk theory of uh, of you know pre modern empires and civilizations. So uh, we're we're running up on time. Uh, do you want to? Do you have a sort of um, closing thought? You know, a uh, main takeaway that someone who's listened to this whole conversation uh, should take from it. Uh, well, I thank you again for for having me. It's been, been a fun conversation. Um, I think um, the you know, maybe one one uh, kind of summary thought is just the the possibility and excitement when um, people who study economics, people who study history, and people who study microbiology um, are working on the same problems because um, the history of human societies really is um, about all the things that we traditionally think of. Um, Talking about economics and growth and investment and labor and markets, um, but it's also um, biology, and I think it's the interplay of those um, things like um, evolution and ecology um, with um, things that economists study that it really is what, what human history is made of. And so I think you need both, and I think it's really exciting when they come together. It's um, it's risky, and of course it. Um, it can be very, very challenging and full of pitfalls um, because all of us get trained for, for years and years and years in a discipline and we learn the, the tools and the subtleties of that field. Um, and so that kind of work across those boundaries can be very hard, um, but I think it's, it's also very rewarding where a lot of the, the opportunities really are. Mm-hmm. And on that note, my guest today has been Kyle Harper. The book is The Fate of Rome, Climate, Disease, and the End of an Empire, which I'll link to at the show notes page at economicsdetective.com. Kyle, thanks for being part of Economics Detective Radio. Thanks, Garrett. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Economics Detective Radio. I certainly enjoyed having that conversation because I'm a big history buff. If you're a longtime listener, you'll you'll know that uh, I had another episode about the fall of Rome early on, um, and I always kind of felt that that was a particularly weak episode. I didn't know nearly as much about the period when I did that interview. I, I didn't, uh, and it kind of uh, was disjointed, jumped around, and, uh, and maybe I didn't uh, have the appropriate tools to sort of challenge my guests and uh, to tell a coherent story with that. So I feel very good about um, recording uh, this interview and uh, doing a much higher quality episode on the Roman Empire and the fall of Rome. Of course, if I wanted to be exhaustive, I would do have to do 100 episodes on Rome. Um, maybe we'll return to this topic again. But in the meantime, I'm very happy with this one. So uh, let this be the more definitive Roman episode of Economics Detective Radio.
I'd like to give a special thanks to my supporters on Patreon. They help support the show and cover the costs of running it and just let me know that people are listening and appreciating the content. So thank you to all of you who support me monetarily. And thanks to all of you who listen to the show. If you want to you know, help me to produce more content, um, the best thing you can do, well, the best thing you can do is... Uh, is become a Patreon supporter. The next best thing you can do is share on social media. I have a marketing budget of precisely zero. So if you can share it with your friends and, uh, you know, tweet the episode, that really helps me uh, to spread through word of mouth. So yeah, thanks for listening. And I hope to have another episode out to you soon.